All right, guys. Well, it is a lovely, exciting, now Monday night. Now, it is a Monday night. I have lost all track. Maybe November 7th or 8th, 2023. Here in the, uh, <laughs> here in the lonesome trailer at the end of the road in the, Swamp in Florida, so uh, another night without internet. This is night number four without internet, so I am uh, <laughs> doing what I can to keep from going crazy. So as a few of you sticking with me know that somehow the universe has put into my hand this manuscript uh, that I wrote in 1980 when I was 21 years old called Maurice and the Rainbow Maker about this little mole named Maurice or nicknamed Mo the Mole. And uh, so we are going to finish out the last two chapters of Maurice and the Rainbow Maker to uh, keep me from going completely crazy. So this is chapter six, The State of Confusion. We left uh, Mo at the end of uh, chapter five. He had fallen into the pits of depression. So uh, that was where Mo was when we last heard from him. It was in the pits of depression. Let's see how he makes it from there to the state of confusion. Take it away. <clears throat> the state of confusion. Maurice was awakened by the sound of whispering voices early the next morning. Well, he thought it was early in the morning, but sunshine never falls on the pits of depression, so he could not tell for sure. He listened closely to what they were saying. Well, we know he's gray because we found those gray hairs at the edge of the pit, said the first voice from the darkness. An elephant, cried the other voice. We've caught our first elephant. You big dummy, said the first voice. If he were an elephant, there would be peanut shells all over the place. But there's not. So, he's not an elephant. <clears throat> Mo could not help laughing when he heard their reasoning why he could not be an elephant. The strangest thing happened when he laughed. He rose off the floor a couple of feet. How about a mouse then? Asked the other voice. Mice have gray hair. No, 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 said the first voice. Elephants are afraid of mice. If he were a mouse, there wouldn't be any elephants in these woods. And if there weren't any elephants in these woods, We'd never have a chance of catching one in this pit. You can't tell me we have been dumb enough to keep coming down into this nasty pit every day for the past two years to look for something that doesn't even live in these woods. We're no dummies, at least I'm not, so he is no mouse. Maurice, who is having his doubts about these two not being dummies, laughed again, and again he floated up, this time a full four feet. Okay then, said the second voice, he's gray, he's not an elephant, and he's not a mouse, so he must be a squirrel. Must be a squirrely. Is he a squirrely or not? Must be a squirrely. <clears throat> I I know how to catch a squirrel, announced the second voice proudly. It's easy. All we have to do is climb a tree and act like a couple of nuts. Excellent idea, agreed the first voice. Let's get out of this pit and find a tree. We both know how to act like nuts. 
Mo thought about the two of them in a tree acting like nuts. He burst out laughing. Laughter poured out of him like his tears had the night before. As he laughed, he rose through the air like a genie on a magic carpet. In a minute, he could see a ray of sunshine. In another minute, his laughter lifted him out of the pits of depression and he was back in the forest in the warm sunshine. The two voices laughing also were right behind Mo. They came into sight and Maurice saw the voices belonged to two identical twins, both pot-bellied, bow-legged little men wearing red overalls. They climbed laughing from the pits of depression and stopped when they saw Mo. Why, you're not a squirrel, said the one on the right, genuinely surprised to see Mo was not a squirrel. That's right, said Mo. I'm a mole. My name is Mo. Who are you? I am Cray, said the one on the right, and he is Z. He pointed to his twin on the left. I thought you were crazy, said the one on the left, and I was Z. That's what I just said, isn't it? Asked the one on the right, who Mo assumed was named Cray. He was so confused, he really didn't care anymore. No, said the second voice. I distinctly heard you say I am Cray, and don't listen to those two, called a voice from behind Mo. Mo turned around and saw a very serious-looking man who looked like he was heading somewhere very important. Don't listen to them, he said again. They're both half crazy. How do you do? I'm on my way out. My name's Maurice, Mo said quickly. He didn't want to hold up the busy man. Before you leave, could you please tell me where I am? Did I say I was going somewhere, said the man? Mo thought he'd said he was going somewhere, but everything was so mixed up, Mo couldn't tell what anything meant anymore. You are in the state of confusion, Maurice, and if you just got here, you'll probably be here for a while. For once, Mo could understand what somebody was telling him. Do you by any chance know how to get in touch with the Rainbow Maker? Mo asked hopefully. Friend, I'd love to stay and talk, said the man while buttoning his jacket, but I am on my way out. He walked away in a hurry. With on my way out, out of the way, and with Cray and Z up in a tree acting like half crazy nuts, Mo was alone in the state of confusion. For lack of anything better to do, he started walking, still clutching his piece of the rainbow. A short way into the forest, Mo passed a sign that said, Entering Out. Mo had always thought you entered into things and exited out of them but he had already learned many times that things were not always what he thought they should be, especially in the state of confusion. And Maurice was really in a state of confusion now. Suddenly, all the trees in the forest had the pulp that was normally on the inside of them on the outside covering their bark. All of the branches grew into the trunks instead of out of them. And to top it off, roots sprung from the tops of all the trees. Mo came upon a small road with the curbs running down the middle while the yellow line ran down the sides. He followed the road between houses that had all of their rooms on the outside surrounding the brick walls and windows which faced inward. More confused than ever before, Mo walked into out and walked to the town square. He wasn't surprised to find that out's town square consisted of a block of buildings 
with their back doors facing the street, surrounded on all four sides by a city park. <clears throat> Mo spied two little girls playing in the park, but he couldn't figure out what they were playing. They would run in opposite directions for a few feet, turn around, run toward each other, and pass each other, only to wind up running in opposite directions again. Mo could not imagine what the object of the game was, but they never seemed to get tired of it. Maurice called them, and they almost smashed into each other while running toward him. They seemed to have a lot of trouble running together in the same direction. Giggling, they finally reached Mo. I was just interested in who you are and what you were playing, said Mo. We are to and fro, the little girls said at the same time, and we're running back and forth. What does it look like we're doing? Mo felt stupid then. In the state of confusion, things in fact were not confusing at all. Anywhere else, running back and forth without going anywhere would seem pointless, but in the state of confusion, running back and forth was as good a thing to do as anything else. I should not have asked, said Mo. Before you little girls get back to your game, could you please tell me where I am? You're inside out, to and fro said. Can't you tell? Mo felt like a dumb tourist. Before he could ask another dumb tourist question, to and fro were back at their game. Of course, chuckled Mo to himself, I'm inside out. It wasn't until Mo heard his own words that he looked down at himself. When he did, he stopped laughing, because instead of his beautiful gray fur coat, Mo saw only his skeleton. Horrified, Mo started running out of out as fast as he could go. He could hear his bare bones rattling as he ran down the streets of out. It wasn't until he passed the sign that said leaving out and he started seeing normal trees again and stopped hearing the sound of his own bones that Mo stopped running. He glanced down and saw that he was right side out again. Whew, said Mo, wiping his sweaty brow. Having left out, he thought it felt much better to leave out than to be left out. Once again, he started off looking for a way out of the state of confusion as much as he was looking for the rainbow maker. It wasn't long before Maurice heard all sorts of strange noises over the chirping of the, of the crows and the calling of the sparrows in the state of confusion's confused forest. As usual, Mo wasn't sure what the sounds meant or what type of strange creature was making them. First, Mo would hear loud bellows of joyous laughter, trumpets trumpeting, and drums booming, all sounds of somebody having a great time. But the happy sounds would stop abruptly, and there would soon follow loud boo-hoos of crying and groaning, as if someone were in great misery. This crazy pattern went back and forth. Mo followed his ears to a small clearing in the forest where his eyes were met by what he thought was the single strangest sight of his entire trip. Sitting in the middle of the clearing was a fat black and white panda bear. He had a trumpet stuck in his mouth and he was banging a big kettle drum. On top of the panda's head was a tiny fuzzy creature that was laughing and dancing to the noise. It was about a foot tall, most of which was two long green legs. The creature was little more than a fluffy ball of pink fuzz with laughing blue eyes. 
Mo laughed when he saw the strange duo. Sitting upside down on the ground beside the panda and his funny, fuzzy friend was another creature, this one as ghastly as the pink one was merry. Though it was shaped like the first creature, this beastie was the ugly, sooty gray color of big city snow. Mo thought its heart was probably as ugly as its outside. It stared at the merriment going on in front of it, frowning and growling. Suddenly, the ugly little creature pounced on top of the panda's head, knocking the pink ball of fluff to the ground at a backward somersault. It sank two needle-sharp fangs into the panda's ear. The panda stopped blowing its trumpet and banging its big kettle drum. Of course, it set up a great hullabaloo of boo-hoos, which shook the whole forest. Maurice ran up to the panda bear to see if he could help. The foul little creature was scared of Bo and hopped off the panda's head. It scampered off into the woods. The pink one was scared of Mo too. It also hid in the woods. Thank you, said the panda. For the first time in an hour, there was quiet in the forest. I was getting quite uncomfortable. I must say, said Mo, that you are the loudest person I've met my whole trip through up above. Tell me, who are you and who were those two little creatures I saw on your head? First of all, said the panda, I am not a human. I'm a panda, a pandemonium to be exact. My pink friend is my up, and that nasty little gray hit a bit of garbage is my down. I love my up, but my down is a real drag. What do you mean you're up and you're down, asked Mo. Do they belong to you? Well, I guess so, said the pandemonium. We've all got our ups and downs. Have you by any chance ever heard of the Rainbow Maker? Mo asked, not really expecting a reply. Well, let me think, said the pandemonium. But before he could finish thinking, the little pink up scurried out of the woods, jumped on the panda's head, and started tickling the bear's ear. The pandemonium whooped with laughter, stuck its trumpet in its mouth, and banged his drum. The forest was again swallowed up in a wave of happy sounds. It had been a long time since Maurice had danced, and he felt in the mood listening to the symphony. The pandemonium and his up were so much fun that Mo twirled around the forest clearing, dancing and laughing all the while. It was the most fun he had on his trip, and he never wanted it to end. But end it did, all too soon. The raucous music stopped and the ear-splitting howling cranked up again. Mo looked toward the pandemonium and saw the vicious little down biting his ear again. Mo ran to scare him off, but this time the down just hissed and growled and refused to let go. The noise and confusion were too much for Mo to bear, and he had to leave. He left the clearing and <clears throat> went back into the forest again. He could hear the pandemonium for almost an hour. A thick white fog rolled into the forest while Mo walked through the state of confusion. Within minutes, the fog became as thick as pancake batter, and Mo couldn't see where he was going. He didn't know if he was ready to smash into a tree, fall into a creek, or fall back into the pits of depression. He was so turned around, he didn't know one minute to the next whether where he was going was where he had been, or where he had, where he had been was where he was at the moment. Not only was Mo in the state of confusion, he was lost in a fog. 
An hour of being lost in a fog was more than Bo could take. He didn't know if he'd ever find his way out again. Walking around in circles aimlessly, he felt that his whole journey had been nothing more than a giant circle from nowhere to nowhere. He was no closer to finding the Rainbow Maker now than he was at the beginning. If it was true that the Rainbow Maker did live on the pinnacle of perfection, Mo knew it wasn't any use looking for him anymore. That's it, Mo yelled at the top of his little voice into the dense fog. I am finished, through. I'll never find the Rainbow Maker. Just let me find my way out of the, this fog and I'll go back home under the ground where moles belong. Once again, Mo started crying, and he spent the whole afternoon crying and lost in a fog. Finally, as suddenly as it had rolled in, the fog rolled out again. Once more, Mo could see the forest, and he saw that he was in a very beautiful part of it. Indeed, he was in a grove of thick green fir trees that formed a roof over his head, and laid a soft carpet of pine needles at his feet. A small stream snaked its way through the grove of trees. Bubbles in the water splashed and giggled as they floated over the boulders in the water and landed laughing in a cool pool. The sun was going down quickly, its late afternoon rays painting the forest floor a rich golden hue. Mo decided to camp out in the beautiful spot for his last night in Up Above. Tomorrow, he would head back home and show all his friends his piece of the rainbow. He sat down on a log to take a much-needed rest. Excuse me, said a voice from somewhere beneath Mo. Could you please move down a few inches? You're sitting on me. I'm terribly sorry, said Mo. He jumped up and moved down the log. He tried to see who was speaking, but saw no one. I'm afraid I don't know who I'm talking to, Mo said apologetically. Don't worry about it, said the voice, which sounded very bored. I'm just a bump on a log. I'm used to being sat on. Mo looked again, and he, did in, and he did indeed see a small bump on the log. It looks like you've been here a long time, said Mo. It's been 20 years at least, groaned the bump on a log. I was a beautiful branch on a big oak tree for many years. I used to be covered with a crown of glossy green leaves, but old oak trees die. So now, I just lie around on the ground and rot. Why don't you get up and go out more, asked Mo. It looks really pretty around here. I'm sure you could find a lot to do. I don't care to do anything, said the bump on a log. I'm fine just sitting here. It might not be the most exciting place in the world, but at least... I don't put a lot of time and energy into doing something only to have it fall through. Haven't you ever failed at something you really had your heart set on? It's no fun and not worth it. You, you can't fall if you never try. Am I right? I tell you, I'll be a bump on a log any old day. Maurice had gotten very bored listening to the very boring old bump on a log whine about its problems. After all Mo had been through, he wasn't going to turn out like that. True, you could not fall if you didn't try. You couldn't fail if you didn't try, but you couldn't have very much fun either. Maurice had nothing more to say to the dreary old bump on a log. He wasn't going to bring up the rainbow maker for sure. Maurice stepped off the back of the log 
and stretched out on a soft mattress of pine needles. He smelled the delicious aroma of pine, and he heard the little stream giggling behind him. His last night in Up Above was going to be a fine one. And that brings us to the final chapter of Maurice and the Rainbow Maker, where Mo discovers the simple truth that we will have to wait till the next and final chapter to find out what is the simple truth. Coming right up. Bye, guys.